Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Pageant, a 25th anniversary spectacular. I'm David Ford. And I'm Reagan Courtney, and I want to welcome you also to this, the 25th year that the choir of Houston's First Baptist Church has entertained you and delighted you, educated you, and inspired you with songs and scenes for Christmas. I've been the host of this for 20 years. When I started off in 74, I had a dark brown beard. <laughs> Life's been hard and been painful, but I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm here. Um, because I like being in Texas this time of year. Yeah, Reagan, it's the same with me. Uh, I love living in Nashville, Tennessee, but there's something about coming home to Texas that's it's always so exciting. I mean, these people are so friendly, and the weather, it's always just perfect. I love it here, man. David, we're going to put you into a home. <laughs> uh, have you ever been here in August on Katy Freeway when your air conditions out? Or how about in October when they had that little little rain shower. Boy, the weather's not always no, perfect here. That's true. But that really doesn't matter because this time of the year, it's always beautiful. In fact, no that's matter where you That's lead in are, for a song of ever. <laughs> it is, it is, that's what it is. It's the most wonderful time of the year With the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the ha happiest season of all. With those holiday greetings and gay happy meetings when friends come to call. It's the ha happiest season of all. There'll be parties for hosting marshmallows for roasting and caroling on in the snow. They'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmas's long ago. It's the most wonderful time of the year. There'll be much mistletoe blowing and hearts will be glowing when love was Nipping at your nose 
Yuletide carols being sung by a choir and folks dressed up like Eskimos. Everybody knows a turkey and some mistletoe help to make the season bright. Tiny tots with their eyes all aglow will find it hard to sleep tonight. They know that Santa's on his way. He's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh. And every mother's child is gonna spy to see to kids.
the shuffle and the ring of their donkey's feet, and a kingly virgin's womb, and there were no crowds to see.
For 25 years, we've had the incredible honor of telling the story by means of pageant. And so for 20 years as I've come here, my thoughts have turned to happy thoughts, you know, Christmas and family and children, like, like everybody else's thoughts. And, and our thoughts have turned to gratitude for God's gift to us. It's a wonderful time of year working with these people. Um, I know you all have busy schedules during the Christmas holiday seasons, everybody does, but these people that do this pageant, the choir, the crew, what a schedule. They, they go to work in the factory or the office, like you all do, or at home, then they come to church and rehearse four, five, six hours a night, go to bed, what little bit of nights left, sleep, go to work the next morning, work all day, come here, rehearse, and then they come during the pageant, do the performances. And what sounds to you like a herd of buffaloes going across the stage in a locomotive right about now, that's really not noise. That's really the sound of my good friends on the crew at work. Now, these are the saints of God. They're humble. Nobody ever sees them, and they never get applause. So I'd like for you all to encourage them. Yay, crew! They pay me money to make you all do that so they can feel good, and I appreciate it. Um, but it's been such a joy to be part of this choir. I feel like they're my family, my church. I, I think of so many that are not here anymore that have gone on to be with the Lord. I remember the last time I was here, Earl was still with us. He was singing. He stood upstage right and sang. He was 93 years old, singing his part in the choir. What a what an inspiration he was. And I think of Mindy Klassen, a dear, sweet woman who passed away, and she was part of the pageant. She worked with the children. She's gone to be with the Lord. I guess probably right now she's got a little group together, and she's rehearsing a Christmas pageant with the original cast. We, <laughs> we miss her, and we love her. We know where she is this year. Well, every year we've worked up ideas to try to somehow express the holidays to you. Remember those Dickens Christmas scenes we did, old English thing with those big English hoop skirts and the wonderful sets. And we had the early American Christmases. And then we had Christmas uh, shopping scenes where everybody rushed around buying presents. And Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future. And then last year we had Christmases of all the different decades of the 20th century. So, what are we gonna have this year? <laughs> Just wait and see. My name is Doris, Doris Frum. Well, hello. I, I'm, um, I'm Reagan Courtney. Doris Frum. The name sounds so familiar to me. Oh, I know, I know. I was in Vietnam with a guy named Forrest Gump. Um, so, what are you reading? Oh, I'm reading a book my papa gave me. It's all about a man who had a dream, who wanted to give something to this city it had never had before. He had a plan, and he had all these talented individuals that helped him. Oh, you told him. And, and they together, they created a Houston tradition, the annual December spectacle. Oh, Bud Adams and the Oilers. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 did I say spectacle? Yeah. Oh, I meant to say spectacular. I, I'm reading about the pageant at First Baptist Church. Oh, well, I know all about that. I've been in it for 20 years. In fact, I'm on my way to a performance tonight. Really? Yep, really. Oh, you're not going to believe this, but I have a ticket to see it for the very first time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It says, Saturday, matinee, okay. All that rhymes. Well, it does. Uh, well, would you, would you like a chocolate? <laughs> well... Uh, thank you very much. You know, my papa says that Christmas pageant is just like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. Well, he said a mouthful there. But I've been reading this pageant book, and I do know two things you're gonna get from pageant. What? One, Baptists who dance, and, and two, these Baptists don't smoke camels, they ride them. Mm 
Mais... What, what bus are you waiting for? I'm waiting for the number nine. I'm waiting for the number nine, too. <gasps> Mr. Courtney? Yes, Do Mrs. You... Gum? My papa says that each one of us has a destiny, and my destiny tonight is to get to a Christmas party where there'll be this beautiful Christmas tree. I, I like Christmas trees. I love Christmas trees. In fact, that could be my most favorite part of Christmas is the Christmas trees. Except for the food. The food part of Christmas is very good. Uh, here's, I want to show you, here's my official invitation to the party. It's the address of where I'm going. Hmm. 2300 River Oaks Boulevard, the number nine bus stops at the front door. Well, that's where I'm going. Why don't you go with me and I'll just show you where to get off. Okay, great. Good. Oh, here comes the bus now. Okay. Oh, don't forget your books. Oh. Oh, it's just like my papa always says, stupid is as stupid does.
minute much food for you. Plenty of beverages. Make yourself at home in my humble abode and you will notice the buffet table. It's placed directly under the portrait of my late husband and his first wife. <laughs> Santa is there. He has presents for all. And they'll be caroling at the piano with Jana. Once again, I say to you, welcome, enjoy, and Merry Christmas. expense in throwing this party. <laughs> I have entertainment for you too. Not only food and beverages, but entertainment. At this time, I want you to sit back and enjoy my favorite Christmas selection of the season. It is entitled Parade of the Wooden Soldiers.
especially this one. He's my favorite. Now, I have this extra special entertainment for you now. I have spared no expense. Expense is really not a problem with me. But I brought this artiste in. He's a dear friend of mine. He's charming. He's witty. He's oh so handsome and extremely talented. May I present to you my friend, the piano juggler, Mr. Dan Menendez. Come out, Dan. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. This is the bounce piano here, the world's only bounce piano. And I am the world's only bounce piano player. I guess that makes me the best. <laughs> and the worst. But I'm going to get back to the keyboard here and play a little classical music for you tonight. I'm going to start out with some Beethoven. Here we go. Thank you. And now, the five ball song. <laughs> I'm working on Flight of the Bumblebee. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> not working out. Is it? Thank you very much. I'd like to show you a very quick three ball juggling trick that I've been working on for about 15 years. A very difficult trick that I worked on for a long time. This first trick is where I attempt it's where I, it's where I attempt to catch this ball on my ear. <laughs> That's this ball on this ear. Keep your eye on that pink ball. It's 
right here. <laughs> it happens real. Well, wrong ear. <laughs> wrong ball. <laughs> You know, I practice this so much it wore my hair away. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> and now the hard part. No, that's not it. <laughs> Still not it. <laughs> Here we go. We Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go with the hard part. That's it.
The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that lived in the land of darkness, in the shadow of death upon them, the light will shine. I am Isaiah, prophet of the Most High God. How does one become a prophet? Well, God speaks and you obey. I remember in a vision once I saw God. I'd gone to the temple to worship as was my custom. It was the year King Uzziah died. And I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train from his robe filled the temple like smoke. And about him stood great angels, seraphim, and each angel had six wings. With two, they covered their eyes. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they did fly and call out one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the whole sanctuary shook with the sound of their voices. And I said, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in a people of unclean lips. And one of those great angels went to the altar that always burns before the Almighty and took with a pair of tongs a burning coal and came toward me. I thought surely I would pay with my life for my sin. I felt as the angel drew nearer the heat from that coal grow in intensity. I thought my skin would melt and my hair burst into flame. And just as that coal touched my lips, I felt no pain. I felt a, I felt a warmth course through my body. I felt cleansed. And I kissed that glowing ember. And I heard the voice of God say, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? I said, here am I, send me. And so I come here to tell you of the prophecies and to tell you that all prophecy, all scripture points to the coming of the promised one. Listen to the prophecy, mine and the prophecy of the others. It all comes from God. And the Lord appeared to me and said, Nathan, this shall you say to my servant David, the king of Israel. It shall come about when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will raise up one of your descendants after you, who shall be of your sons. And I will establish his kingdom forever. And the Lord will give a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I, Micah, say, but as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, yet out of you shall one come forth for me who is to be the ruler in Israel. He will arise and shepherd his flock. He will be great to the ends of the earth. And this one will be our peace. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Wonderful. Counselor. Counselor, the Mighty God, the, mighty God. the Everlasting Father. Father, the Prince of Peace.
My name is Gabriel. I am one of God's angels, sometimes referred to as heavenly messengers, since one of our duties was to deliver communications directly from God to his people on earth. Sometimes we appeared in their dreams, but often we appeared face to face with those for whom his message was intended. I have come to tell you the story of the birth of Jesus. When the clock of time had struck the long-awaited hour of salvation and God had appointed us to come to share the good news with him, he sent me to the Virgin Mary to tell her that the Christ child would be born unto her. Have I frightened you? I am sorry. Do not be afraid. I am Gabriel, an angel sent from God. He has sent me with the most important message in the history of the world. So listen carefully, my child, and follow closely. Mary, you shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and be called the Son of the Most High, the Messiah. The Messiah? But I am unworthy. God knows the secrets of your heart. He does not expect perfection. This child that he will send you will be human as well as holy. God wills it so in order that man, who is also human, can find his way back to God. But I am not yet married. How can this thing be? With God, all things are possible. Blessed are you among women, Mary, for the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the child that is born to you will be the Son of God. I will strive to be worthy. When Mary told Joseph the good news, he considered the situation a long time. After all, this was a fantastic story and a great deal to ask of any man. By human standards, he was justified in breaking off their engagement. But he inclined instead to, to sacrifice himself rather than embarrass her. It was not until he had made up his mind to this kind and generous course that God finally intervened. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary to be your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit and she shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins fear not Joseph fear not fear not fear not Joseph went to Mary at once to tell her of his dream now he understood her radiance and her joy they were married and withdrew gradually from the world. 
Mary occupied herself with the responsibilities of her new home, with the care and comfort of Joseph. But most importantly, with the preparations for the child that would soon be born. Many months later, the little town of Nazareth and all of Israel were startled by the news of a different messenger. A messenger sent from King Herod in Jerusalem. Now hear this, now hear this. An edict has gone forth from Caesar Augustus that the entire world should be enrolled. Citizens of Nazareth, listen and heed. As I, the king of Judea, am the friend of Caesar, I have decreed that this enrolling shall be made throughout my kingdom. Let every man return to the place of origin of his house and family and have his name inscribed there in the public registers. I, King Herod, have spoken. Long live King Herod! Caesar did not know or care about Jewish prophecies or scriptures. But just the same, he unwittingly arranged for the true king of Israel to be born in the exact location the prophet Micah had spoken of hundreds of years before, in Bethlehem. And so everyone prepared for their journeys to the four corners of the land for the census. Joseph and Mary set off for Bethlehem the town of David, because Joseph was from the house and line of David. But when they arrived, they found the city overflowing with people. Joseph went from house to house only to be turned away until, in desperation, he went to the village inn where, again, there was no room. But there was the stable. And so, with barely a ripple of notice, God stepped into the warm lake of humanity without protocol and without pretension. Where you would have expected angels, there were only flies. Where you would have expected royal courts, there were only donkeys and a few haltered cows, a nervous ball of sheep tethered camel and a, a scurry of curious barn mice. Oh yes, and a magnificent star shone in the sky to mark the place of this birth. Thus, in the little town of Bethlehem, that one silent night, the royal birth of God's son tiptoed quietly by as the world slept. And oh, the wonder that he would lay aside his kingly robes and wrap himself in clothes of flesh to become like man, so that man might one day become like him. It was on that same night I had another message. It was to a group of shepherds spending the night with their flocks of sheep in the hills around Bethlehem. Do not be afraid, do not be afraid, but listen well. I bring you good news of a great joy which shall come to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the town of David, the Savior of man, who is Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you to recognize him. After searching, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest!
Hear now the word of the Lord. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. And the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength and knowledge. With righteousness he will judge the needy, and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will be a light to the Gentiles, to open the eyes that are blind. Then will the ears of the deaf be unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shall shout for joy. Thus saith the Lord. Did you hear? Did you? When this promised one comes, the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Those eyes that never beheld light scattered across a dimple lake will see. Those eyes that never beheld the look of love in their father's face will see. Those eyes that never beheld red will see. And the deaf ear will be unstopped. That poor person who had lived always in silence will suddenly hear the wind blowing through the cedars, will hear birds welcoming the dawn, will hear their name called. And the crippled who have always had to drag themselves along or scurry like a crab or be carried by friends suddenly will have strength in their legs like a stag to leap across mountains dancing in praise to God. And the mute the mute who never was even able to utter the Psalms, who never called out to a friend, that tongue will be able to say for the first time, I love you. From the very first moment Jesus came, there never was a man like him. The story of Jesus I have to tell is how he touched and changed me. It's the story of how he went to all the towns and villages, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing the lives of the people. My name is Mary, usually called Mary Magdalene, as I come from the little town of Magdala, on the coast of Galilee, a few miles from Capernaum. I was a seamstress by trade and managed to be of comfortable standing in the little community of Magdala. But inside, I was troubled by forces I did not understand. Even the simplest struggles of life overwhelmed me, often crippling me with an anguish I could not overcome. It was on one of those days that I saw a man coming toward me with compassion in his eyes. I couldn't take my eyes away from his. He commanded the tormenting demons out of my body and instantly the miracle happened. My deranged and nerve-wracked mind became as tranquil as a peaceful lake. He touched me. touched me and all oh, the joy that filled my soul something happened and now I know he touched me he made one of his followers, and along with Joanna and Susanna, two of my friends who also had been healed by him, went with Jesus and the twelve men he had followed, chosen to follow him. We went from place to place, preaching and teaching the message of God's love, all over Galilee and to Jerusalem for the feasts. But it was Capernaum where he made his headquarters, where he would return after a day spent teaching and healing. This is where we would ask him questions and he would provide us with the answers. This is where he was one day when a ruler of the synagogue 
an important person, Jairus, came to him. Master, my daughter, she's dying. But I know if you would come to her and lay your hand on her, she would be healed. Take me to her. Hurry, Master, this way. Everywhere Jesus went, he was surrounded by people. The word about him spread rapidly, and the curious and the afflicted sometimes overwhelmed him and made it impossible for him to move. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, leave Jesus, away. son of David, have mercy on me. Bring that man to me. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. Receive your sight. <laughs> your faith has healed you. Master, Master! <clears throat> your daughter. She's dead. Dead? Don't. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. Jairus, Jairus, do not be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. Come. Why are you all crying? The child is not dead, she is only asleep. Who are you that you come here mocking our grief? You haven't even seen the girl yet. We watched her for hours. We know she is dead. <coughs> now, bring her something to eat. You know, perhaps we could all do with something to eat. Master, forgive my rudeness. I, I thought the girl was dead. No. I, I know she was dead. I saw her with my own eyes. Do you believe only what you see with your own eyes? I don't know what to believe anymore. To doubt so much must mean that you long for certainty and to know the absolute truth. I do. I want to know for sure. Then follow me. You mean leave my work, but yes, it's all... Yes, yes. I want you. Giants, will you give me your servant Thomas to be one of my disciples? Gladly, Master. And bless his good fortune. Tell no one what has happened to you. From the very first moment Jesus came, there never was a man like him. He was God's own son, sent down to
Jesus traveled to the town of Nain, a few miles south of Capernaum near Mount Tabor. As he approached the gates of the city, he was stopped by a funeral procession for the only son of a widow. I say to you, do not weep. And young man, I say to you, arise. bring back life. It brought fear to all who witnessed it, but fear soon gave way to the feeling of awe and reverence. It was after this miracle with the boy, seen by so many, that people began to recognize him as the Messiah. At Bethany, a little town outside Jerusalem where Jesus always stopped at the home of his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, one of the places where he was loved and understood, Jesus performed the most stunning of all his mighty works. This time upon his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had died and had been in the tomb four days. It was this miracle that brought the Sanhedrin to its final decision about Jesus. Father, I know that you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people here, that they may know that you have sent me. Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Unbind him and take him home. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even though he dies. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall prosper, and he shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one into his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. I, Zechariah, say to you, rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. He is humble and will be riding on a donkey. The Lord God said unto me, Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming when I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their iniquities and their sin. I will remember no more. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. He was cut off from the land of the living. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our sins, and upon him was the chastisement of us all. And by his stripes, we are healed. The story I must tell you of Jesus is not a very happy one. I'm ashamed to tell you most of it for the way in which I and my soldiers treated him. My name is Claudius Sardis. I am a centurion in the Imperial Army of Rome. My legion, the 10th Legion, had the unfortunate burden of being assigned to Jerusalem and more particularly to Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea. I use the term unfortunate burden because Jerusalem is considered to be the holy city by the Jews and with Romans both policing and governing them. Riots and violence always seem to be erupting from the radicals among them. My story of Jesus begins at the Feast of Passover. It was always an especially busy time for us since the population of Jerusalem doubled with the thousands of Jews that came for the celebration and also to make sacrifices at the temple. Orders had come down to us to keep an eye out for the Nazarene and his followers who were expected to be among the throng. Rumors were spreading like wildfire. Wherever he went, huge crowds seemed to gather. But it was the latest rumor about him having raised a man from the dead in Bethany that had the authorities worried.
Teacher, tell your people to be quiet. This isn't the time or place for such behavior. Such cries are dangerous. They must be silenced. I tell you, if I should seek their silence, these very rocks would cry out! <laughs> Throughout the week of Passover, Jerusalem was alive with talk about Jesus, the new Messiah, who'd begun the week with a rather impressive entrance into the city and narrowly averted a dangerous riot when he drove the money changers from the outer courts of the temple. After that, he sort of dre drifted out of the center of the picture, and all that one could hear of him was that he was eh, in and about the temple doing nothing more than talking theology with the rabbis and spending his nights in Bethany. By Thursday, I'd begun to believe that this Nazarene alert was nothing more than another ploy by the Jewish authorities to get us to do their work for them. They'd tried that before. Now that Passover was here, all the Jews would be in their homes celebrating with their families. Tomorrow at sundown begins Sabbath. It was always a very quiet time. Actually, uh, I was looking forward to this evening's meal. You see, uh, I developed quite a liking for lamb myself. We spent the day making arrangements for Passover. We left Bethany early in the morning, met and followed a man carrying a jar of water to an upper room, and prepared the meal in the kitchen below. Peter and John were late returning with the lamb from the temple because there were long lines at the altar of sacrifice. With so much to do, I was afraid all would not be ready when Jesus arrived. desired to share this Passover with you before I am to suffer. This is the bread of life. He who eats of this bread shall have eternal life.
Take it, take it, drink it, drink it. Each time you do, Each time you do, just commandment I give to you. That you love one another as I have loved you. Let not your tr hearts be troubled nor fearful. You believe in God believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. I am going there to prepare a place for each of you. It was very early on Friday morning when I was awakened by one of my men who had come to tell me that Caiaphas the high priest demanded the arrest of Jesus on charges of blasphemy. So I sent a detail of my men to meet with Judas, who led them to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was arrested and taken before Caiaphas. There, he was questioned before the Sanhedrin who found him guilty of blasphemy, a crime punishable by death. But under Roman jurisdiction, they had no authority to carry out the death sentence, so they sent him to Pontius Pilate. Pilate was unable to find any grounds for any charge against Jesus, so he sent him to be judged by King Herod, since Jesus was a Galilean and Galilee was under his jurisdiction. Herod was happy to see Jesus. He thought perhaps he might perform some miracles for him. But Jesus gave him nothing, not even answers to his questions. So Herod ridiculed him, threw a red military cloak around his shoulders, and sent him back 
to Pontius Pilate. Once again, Pilate could find no reason for carrying out the death sentence against Jesus. In fact, he was prepared to have Jesus flogged and released, since it was customary to release one Jewish prisoner in celebration of Passover. Any man who claims to be king is surely speaking treason against Caesar. If you let him go, it will be said that you are no friend of Caesar. Why not let the people decide? And let the voice of the people be heard. Let the people enter the courtyard. It is the Passover, a time of clemency. According to a custom of yours, I should release one prisoner. Shall I release this man? What then shall I do with this one who claims to be king of the Jews? Now begins the part of my story of which I am most ashamed. When Pilate washed his hands of the matter, Jesus was handed over to my soldiers for the crucifixion. As preparations were being made for the execution, he was held in the praetorium. It was there that my soldiers mocked and humiliated him. Oh, they were bored and angry at having drawn an assignment in such a desolate place as Judea. They read the charge against him, which was to be an inscription placed above him on the cross that said he was some sort of a king. So the reed of a thorn bush was placed in his hand as though it was his scepter. A crown of flowering thorns was placed upon his head. Then they knelt down before him and mockingly said, Hail, King of the Jews. Since the motive of crucifixion is to make an example, a public example of the condemned, Jesus was forced to carry his cross through the crowded streets to the place of execution, Golgotha, Hill of the Skull. There, the nails were driven into his hands and his feet. This began the darkest hours of all eternity.
this was the Son of God. Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy Pharisee, had a family burial site not far from Jerusalem. He approached Pontius Pilate and received permission for the remains to be buried in his own never used tomb. It was to this place that he and others carried the body of Jesus and there anointed it with aloes and myrrh and then wrapped his body in burial cloths. When they were finished, my soldiers removed the wedge that allowed the stone to roll across the entrance, and then the tomb was sealed. As Jesus' body lay in that sepulcher, his mission of peace and redemption ended in disgrace. The hopes and dreams of his followers for a new kingdom of God on earth shattered. Now it seemed that he was no different than any other man. But to me, it seemed that he was indeed unlike any other man. I tell you this next part of the story because I am the only one who witnessed what happened. I went back to the tomb early on the first day of the week and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance and found the tomb empty. Someone had stolen the master. Who would come in the night and take away his body? What did it mean? I sat there totally bewildered 
And suddenly, he appeared to me. At first, I thought it was the gardener. But when he spoke my name, I recognized the voice of the master. He said, go tell the others. And I couldn't get there fast enough. My heart was bursting with hope. My tears became tears of joy. Suddenly, my life had a purpose. My despair turned to happiness and peace as I told them, Jesus is alive. I just saw him. The prophecy has been fulfilled. He's risen from the dead as he said he would. He's alive again. He lives. He lives. Well, that's the story of Jesus. 2,000 years ago, he was born contrary to the laws of nature. He was raised in obscurity, yet reared in dignity, the child of a, a peasant woman and a carpenter man. Though he had neither wealth nor influence, his humble birth threatened a mighty king. Though he had no formal education or training, as a man, he astounded and challenged the wisest of men. He wrote no songs, yet he has become the theme of countless symphonies of song. He penned no books, and yet has had more words written about him than all the libraries of the world could hold. Today, he remains the central figure of human history, a timeless mystery of love. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the kings that ever reigned, all the powers ordained of this world together have never affected, never touched the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. Twenty-five years, we've told you the story. And now we put our props away and take off our costumes and go home back to reality. And it's time for you to go back to your world. But we wanted you, as you leave here, to take with you this final picture. It's a beautiful picture that you can ponder in your heart throughout this entire holiday season. Indeed, like Mary, you can ponder in your heart for the rest of your life. It's a beautiful picture and some beautiful songs. It's about a manger, a star, some kings, and a baby. Oh, come, all ye faithful, let us adore him. Christ, the Lord, 